This is a lesson on conservation of angular momentum in the momentum and rotational dynamic units. We first saw conservation of momentum when we were looking in linear terms. After we learned that momentum is some inertial factor times the speed, we incorporated Newton's second law to see that if there's no net force on a system, then there's no change in momentum and we can use conservation of momentum. And we did this with linear examples in one and two dimensions. Just like we can do this linearly, we can also do this rotationally. If we apply a torque for a certain amount of time, that causes a change in angular momentum. And we saw that in the lesson prior to this one. If there's no external torque, if there's no net torque on a system from the outside, then there's no change in angular momentum. And we can say that the initial angular momentum is equal to the final angular momentum. And we have several equations here in order to calculate angular momentum. This is called conservation of angular momentum and occurs only if the net torque is equal to zero. And often what you're going to see in this situation is that the moment of inertia will change for a system of objects, therefore causing a change in angular speed. Just like we looked at different types of collisions with linear momentum, the same concept applies for conservation of angular momentum. If total energy does not change, if the total energy of a system remains constant, then we can say that that collision is elastic and there's no kinetic energy lost. Contrarily, if there's some sort of loss in kinetic energy, we are going to say that's an el inelastic collision. Please keep in mind that just because a collision is inelastic does not mean that the two objects stick together. Due to the identity between angular momentum and the omega, the angular speed of a system, we can do a substitution and see, just like linear momentum, is related to kinetic energy. Angular momentum can be directly related to kinetic energy. So if you're calculating any um, initial or final kinetic energy, you can use a simpler equation rather than 1 half i omega squared. I've picked one problem out for us to do an exemplification of this concept. It says a 35 kilogram child sits on a merry-go-round at a radius of 0.8 meters, spinning at 0.75 revolutions per second. Okay, so I'm just going to pause there. I have an initial and final for the merry-go-round here. I didn't include any of the handles on it. I was just looking at the larger mass of the merry-go-round. So initially, if I say this is the axis of rotation, initially it says that the child is 0.8 meters away from the center and it has a radius of 1.5 meters. So here's the radius out to here. The radius equals 1.5 meters. The child starts at 0.8 meters. So there's the radius of the child and I'm going to call this R1. I'll call there it is 0 0.8 meters. The mass of the child, I'll call the child a little m, that's 35 kilograms. And it also says here that the mass of the merry-go-round is 200 kilograms. So the merry-go-round is much larger than the child. I'm going to let the merry-go-round and the child be twisting around such that the angular momentum when I do right hand rule if I curl it in the direction that I have, that means the angular momentum vector is upward. And so that's how you can find direction of angular momentum using right hand rule. And I'm going to draw this in here. There's, I'll put it in a different color too. There's the angular momentum vector upwards, L. And I'm going to call this L initial. So that's sort of the initial situation. The um, information that they've given us here. Another thing I might recognize is that the 0.75 revolutions per second is the omega initial. I'm going to write that over here. Omega initial equals, well, that's three-fourths 
revolutions per second. I'm going to want this in radians per second, so I'm just going to take a second to change this. One revolution is 2 pi radians, and overall I get 6 over 4, which is 3 halves pi radians per second. So if I need that in the equations, I have that number. It says the child moves to the outer edge of the merry-go-round. Okay, so in the final position, the child is out here. And I'm going to call this R2. R2 equals 1.5 meters. The child moved out there. What is the new angular velocity of the merry-go-round? So there's an omega initial, and there must be some omega final. What I note is that the child moves out to the outside. Anything that happened is internal forces on the system. There was no forces from the outside applied on the system. It was just within. So I'm going to make a note that F external equals zero and that the external torque equals zero. And both of those are the condition I need in order to say that there's conservation of angular momentum. So conservation of angular momentum. And I will say in that situation that the initial angular momentum, which I have a vector of, will equal the final angular momentum. So I can draw that final angular momentum vector in here. They must be in the same direction and they must have the same length and that's how the initial equals the final. Well, we had things happen. This child moved out from in the center of the mail go round to the edge. So when I think about angular momentum, the angular momentum is created by this extended body, the merry-go-round and the child on it. So what's happening is that there's some sort of initial inertial term and an initial speed, which we found here. And that has to equal some sort of final inertial term with some final speed, which we're asked to find. This is what we're asked to find. So when we're looking, I initial the moment of inertia to begin with will be different than the moment of inertia to end with, right? This child moved out to the edge. It changed the radius for this mass. The moment of inertia got larger. So therefore, the speed must have gone down, right? If the moment of inertia gets larger, then the speed must have went down in order to keep a constant value. So let's look at these inertial terms to begin with, an I initial and an I final. Let's get a term going for each. This will equal the moment of inertia of the merry-go-round to and the moment of inertia of the child. The moment of inertia of the merry-go-round is a disk, so one half. This is big M and big R squared. We want the mass of the merry-go-round and the radius of the merry-go-round. And in the initial position, the child is a distance R1 away from the center. So for a point mass, that will be M R squared. So I get M R1 squared for the child. So this is the initial moment of inertia. The final moment of inertia will follow the same pattern. Uh, the merry-go-round doesn't change anything. It's still 1 half mr squared for a disk, but the child moved out to the edge, and so the child has a different r2, and so that makes the two moments of inertia different from one another. I'm going to keep moving forward. We can plug in what we know into here. I'm going to solve for omega final, which we're trying to find, will equal omega initial times I initial over I final. And I like doing that because we have some sort of omega term, which has the units radians per second. And then when I take a ratio of I's, their units will cancel out, and it should be some sort of proportion. So I'm going to plug in what I know in here, um, omega initial, I can plug in 1 half um, r squared plus little m r1 squared, this is the initial, that has to be r1, over the final, which is 1 half big M big r squared plus little m r2 squared. Okay, so we can plug numbers in here, omega initial, I have that up top, 3 halves, 
pi. And then all of this stuff goes in here. I have 200 kilograms at 1.5 squared plus the 35 kilogram child at 0.8 meters squared. Divide by a very similar term, 1 half times 200 times the radius of the merry-go-round squared plus 35, the mass of the kid, times the kid's new radius. Okay, so that's a little bit to plug through your calculator, but not too terrible. And you get omega final equals 3.8382 radians per second. Okay, did it go down? Did it go down? 3 pi, which is 9, um, 9, it must be around 4, between 4 and 5. The initial omega initial was between 4 and 5. And so omega final is less than omega initial, which is what I expected. If the moment of inertia goes up, the omega must go down in order to keep a balance. So that's part A. We have part A solved. Part B asks, can this considered to be an inelastic or elastic collision? Okay, so we're going to have to find some sort of kinetic energy loss, and I'm going to do that down here. Kinetic energy lost. Well, that's going to be the kinetic energy initial minus the kinetic energy final. That would give us a positive term. And I'm going to use the new equation that I introduced that says um, the kinetic energy is directly related to angular momentum. L squared over 2i initial, this will be L initial and I initial, minus L final squared over 2i final. I'm going to remember that L initial and L final are equal to one another, so I'm just going to put L initial squared and factor it out. Out of both of those terms and a 2, and in the parentheses I'm left with 1 over I initial minus 1 over I final. You can plug numbers into here. Uh, L initial is omega initial times I initial over 2, and I have to remember to square that. And uh, 1 over I initial minus 1 over I final. Okay, so now I know more of what I need to plug into that equation in order to solve. Well, I did some calculations on the side for us. Uh, omega initial we know is 3 halves pi and multiply it by I initial. Well, I found out I initial is 274.7. I'm going to square that whole term, divide it by 2. In the parentheses, I'm going to go 1 over I initial, which I know is 247.7. Subtract off 1 over I final. I calculated that. That's 303.75. When you run this through your calculator, you get a non-zero term, clearly, right? This is a non-zero term. So I got 509.599, so I rounded that to 509.6. And we're finding in energy, this is joules. And I'm going to say that this is not equal to zero. And when the kinetic energy loss is not equal to zero, we know this is an inelastic collision. Okay, I know it's weird for a child to walk out to the edge and have n two things like not really collide, but in the sense of momentum and conservation of momentum, this is considered a collision, and we can say it's an inelastic collision.